it's a pleasure for me to be here, not only because Kent is my hometown, but um, uh, I was a little bit involved in the early, very early days of, of how all this developed and I'm very pleased to see to what kind of maturity and quality it has all um, evolved. Uh, at the time when we developed the idea of academizing, what an ugly word, um, professional education in the arts, um, as a part of the changes which were framed under the Bologna process yeah. in this country. Um, we also had very difficult and thorough discussions on what we should do with the, with the uh, arts ed education. Um, and I think we, we chose the right options. It was a very contested option. Uh, and I, th I think it still is, and it should be. Um, but I think it, it gives way to a lot of very interesting developments and Orpheus is certainly um, one of them. I'm not someone from your sector myself. I'm an educational researcher uh, and a policy maker and now working at UECD and you may wonder what is the UECD and God's sake have to tell about, about the arts or about music. Um, and unfortunately, the UECD still has the stigma, the stigma of being an economic organization. Completely wrong. Um, we are interested in, 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 in well-being and, and the future fate of societies. Um, and we do a lot of work on innovation, how societies evolve, how skills are a part of that, how education contributes to innovation. Uh, so that's the kind of questions where I um, spend my mind and my time on. Um, and it's true look, that we that we of course advise governments on many different different issues, but we also try to focus our work as much as possible on the on the broader global challenges that we that we see emerging. Um, what I would like to do now in this in this keynote is um, maybe changing a little bit the the perspective in which I, at least from my perception, the debate on, on research in the arts has um, been framed over the past years. It was very much a debate on what kind of research do we need? Is it really serious research? Does it match the standards of, of, of the scientific sector in, in, in terms of quality of outputs, the rigor of the methodology, the, the publication methods? Um, and so can it really qualify as, as scientific research? And these are interesting questions, but I do not believe they are the most important questions. Um, so I think they are mainly driven by a, a very understandable desire of, of initiatives to, well, to show their legitimacy towards universities and towards the scientific community. Um, and I think you should not exaggerate in, in that ambition. Uh, you should just be yourself and do the things you do. And, but why are these things that you do uh, interesting and, and necessary? That's maybe a more interesting um, question. Um, of course, these improvements and innovations in, in the arts, as in any sector, um, true research are not happen, are happening easily. I sometimes see some uneasiness and, and some a lack of patience uh, in people to show that what they do has an impact. Um, and I think I was a little bit afraid of whether output and impact are the, the right labels to, to frame these questions. Um, I think research in the arts is still a very young field, it's an emerging field, it's a contested field, and I think society should give time to you to develop and to, to develop your own co uh, conceptual frameworks and your own methodologies. Um, but my perspective is um, much more at, at a higher level. Um, how is a certain field of practice and professional <coughs> practice um, and a field of knowledge, how is that evolving and what kind of role can research play in the complex interactions in that field? Um, so for me it's not a question of how can research influence professional practice, a one-way direction, one-directional uh, way of thinking, 
but how are different systems of knowledge interacting in shaping a specific field of practice and, and professionalism. Uh, so that's my, that's my topic. Um, and I think the, the metaphor of the knowledge triangle can be very helpful to, to illuminate these questions. Um, the, no, the knowledge triangle is a metaphor coming from the field of technological innovation. Uh, it has been introduced, I think, some 10, 15 years ago, mainly to, um, to better understand the new roles that research and universities were, were starting to play. Not only the ivory towers of very academic research, but also universities engaging in technological innovations, in valorization of research, um, and that kind of um, practices. But uh, since then, I think the, the, the metaphor has changed a lot. And of course, the context behind all this is, is very important. Uh, I will not deal with all these mega trends, but uh, they are very important in understanding the background, also for your field, um, the, the knowledge society, globalization, uh, professions which have become much more knowledge intensive, and I believe this is also true for uh, the professions in the arts uh, sector. Um, the increasing impact of growing educational entertainment in the population, which is changing practices in so many fields, changing roles of research, but I'm coming back to that, um, the expansion of research, the explosion even of scientific research, um, and the emerging tensions of different natures in the field of research, fundamental applied, there are many others. Um, the role of skills, uh, I'm coming also back on, on this, um, and then, yeah, many challenges where universities or higher, higher education institutions in general are faced with. Um, new roles that they have to play, um, unbundling, I don't know whether the term is familiar to you, it has to do with the pulling apart of different functions of the university which belonged together in the old Humboldtian view of the romantic university. Um, diversification, impact of technologies, new deep types of institutions, etc. So to some of these mega teams I'm, I'm coming back to show how relevant they are. And I start with, a little bit with skills. Um, our interest in the arts sector has started um, by looking at the changes in the skills demand in, in contemporary societies. And this chart uh, is very illuminating. It's one of the most, the most um, appealing charts that I, that I have. Uh, I have, I think, more than 100,000 charts in my life. <laughs> uh, I think this one is, is really one of my favorite. Uh, it's based on an analysis in the US economy of what people in the whole economy actually have to do. So not that kind of jobs, which was the kind of labor market research until a few years ago. But um, labor market sociologists said, well, maybe typologies of jobs is not very, very illuminating, very interesting. We have to look at what kind of things that people actually have to do, whatever their job. Um, and um, Levy and Murnain are two uh, researchers at MIT who started to do this work and they produced a very seminal first paper in, in, in 2005, there is an update in 2009 that I have not yet updated my chart, but it's basically the same. So the, they divided tasks that people do in five broad categories and you have several dimensions. One of the most interesting dimensions is routine versus non-routine skills. Is, is what people have to do based on standardization, on, on procedural knowledge, on routine, um, or is it non-routine, where the, where the level of uncertainty is very high, where people have to do unexpected things. Um, and that's a more interesting uh, dimension than is it creative or not creative, which is sometimes a very popular image to speak about these things. I think the essential because a lot of the tasks that people do in the creative sector are very routine. I think the, from a skills perspective, it's the routine versus non-routine dimension is very important. And then you have cognitive, uh, interactive, manual, analytical, different contents of tasks. 
Um, and you see the enormous dec decline in, um, let's say, the blue line and the, what, what's a strange color, um, where you have the routine manual and the routine cognitive skills um, going down. Uh, and also the non-routine manual uh, are going down, but they, they seem to recover a little bit. The, um, I think the prediction that manual labor is disappearing is not uh, confirmed by reality. But what is disappearing is the easy cognitive tasks. And you have to ask to this chart to what kind of skills do our education systems prepare well. They prepare well for those tasks with which disappear. And they are very bad in preparing for those tasks which seem to become more important, which, are, which is non-routine analytical tasks, which we sometimes call deep thinking or critical thinking, and non-routine uh, interactive or non-routine uh, communication skills. Um, the kind of task that the nurse has to do when dealing with all kinds of situations, unpredictable situations. Um, and it's from this perspective that we think that we have to look at how higher education or education systems in general, regardless of the sector, because the substance of the matter, does, of the discipline, does not really matter. It's the kind of things that people have, have to do with the skills they get. Well, I can show you many similar um, tasks. This is um, over a longer age period, the whole of the 20th century, um, the, the emergence of routine versus creativity oriented jobs, in, in, in this case in Canada, and you see the increase in creative um, tasks that people have to do. Creative is of course not similar to artistic, but um, it's a very interesting thing. In, in this book, which we published a couple of years ago, um, we, we looked at arts education as a sector which uh, has a very important role to play in educational systems, but also towards societies, in, in maybe contributing to the shaping of these new skills, of the, what we sometimes call 21st century skills. Um, and the, the outcomes of our research are not, I'm, I'm skipping here a few, yeah. Um, the, the outcomes are <coughs> of our research, which is basically a meta-analysis of all available research in the world, um, is, is very mixed. Um, I'm just giving you as an example uh, this chart where, where researchers try to analyze the set scores, so the, uh, let's say, upper secondary um, uh, tests uh, in, in the United States um, and they distinguish between people who, between students who took arts classes in, in high schools and those students who, who did not and then looked at their performance or their achievement on all kinds of cognitive fields or cognitive or scholastic tasks um, and you see that there is an enormous difference um, people who took all kinds of arts subjects in high school uh, seem to perform well also on other um, tasks. Um, and there is, of course, there is a lot of research knowledge on, on how, uh, let's say, these creative skills interact with, for example, from, from math education, that's well demonstrated. Um, the problem is that these outcomes of research are very correlational. So you see an enormous amount of correlational relationships between arts education and more academic education. Um, but if you take away the selection effects, then the relationship becomes very weak. And that's what experimental design studies do, but there are very, very few of them. So we are still looking at the dark here we do not really know how these, um, let's say, artistically shaped skills interact with more academic performance. But I'm coming back here to, to this slide. This is a very important slide. We, we looked statistically where people, or people or students, graduates, uh, after 
several years of, of um, being graduated in a job and we identified those people who did innovation jobs, who were very innovative in their jobs. And then we looked at from what sector or what discipline background in higher education they come. And it's very interesting that the arts comes on top in producing the graduates with the highest percentage of people who do innovative jobs, in regardless what kind of employment. Uh, of course, not all those people are employed in the arts. They are employed in many sectors, but they, across the board, they are employed in very innovation-oriented jobs. But, because in innovation research we distinguish between three dimensions of research, of, of innovation, they are em very innovative in product and, and, and service innovation. So the kind of things they produce um, if you look at another dimension of innovation, the knowledge they produce, they are much less um, innovative. And I compared with the education sector, which has a kind of reverse, um, so people who had, for example, a teacher education. So um, the question then is, how does it come that people who who went to arts education seem to acquire those skills which matter for innovation in the economy and the, and the society. Um, and what kind of knowledge mechanisms are behind that, given also the fact that there seems to be a, a relationship to one form of innovation and not to another. So in, in kinds of products, things that people make or produce or shape um, there is a lot of innovation coming from the arts education sector. In terms of knowledge, there is not so much. Um, so now, jumping to the, the, the idea of the knowledge triangle, and as I said, the knowledge triangle is an, is an, is an image, is a metaphor to look at um, the roles of, of the education system, in, uh, the higher education system in particular. And it... Um, introduce the image that the higher education sector is in fact operating in, in an ecosystem, I'm coming back to this, to this term ecosystem, um, with two main other partners, which is the business sector and R&D uh, sector. So the, um, the, the triangle of these relations is really um, shaping higher education very much today. Um, and this is a kind of, let's say, the policy messages that come out of that um, metaphor of the knowledge triangle. It, um, it looks at how universities or higher education institutions can strengthen links between research and education to improve curricula and teaching, and so the teaching function and the research function, then the valorization of research, the enormous explosion of all kinds of valorization activities, also this university here, here in Ghent has developed a huge um, activity in that field, applying research findings in innovative um, and marketable economic practice, um, and then new relationships between education and business and professions, uh, strengthening employability, uh, relevance of curricula, etc. So all the sides of the triangle uh, are, are leading to new activities in, in, in universities and are also leading to diversification in the, in, in the kind of institutions that we have. The, even in Europe, with the strong Hubaldian tradition, uh, I think we are now seeing the, a, an enormous expansion of higher education in the types of institutions um, where you have the traditional university uh, with a strong teaching function and trying to be excellent also in research, with vocational institutions which mainly position themselves on the axis between education and innovation uh, or industry, and then uh, more specialized research institutes which do not very much care about the educational teaching function. Um, and I think every institution has to ask itself in what kind of balance or how these three dimensions are balanced um, in, in its own identity and profile. 
So universities are starting to profile themselves much more in, in that direction. Um, I'm, I'm telling you this because I think it, it reshapes the question on the, on the role of research also in your sector. Because also in your sector, the relationship between teaching and research, the relationship between the professional practice and, and research and between professional practice and education is, uh, I think, a very um, important one. And each form has its own specific knowledge system. It's not so simple that you have a particular knowledge, which, for example, produced by research, which has to then be implemented in, for example, innovation or valorization, or in teaching, in, in translating these forms of research, new forms of knowledge emerge uh, and or knowledge is transformed. Um, and of course this brings us to the question on what kind of knowledges are important in a, in a specific field. Um, and also the sociology of knowledge is, is focusing much more now on the diversification of knowledge. Um, there is not one single truth that I'm far from being a postmodern philosopher. I hate postmodernism. But I do think that there is a variety of ways that people can think and act um, and apply uh, certain knowledges. So in any field, also in the arts, knowledge systems compete with each other. And I'm sure that in your own head, knowledge systems compete between the identity of a researcher, the identity of a teacher, the identity of a professional musician. So there are many more flexible forms and ways of knowledge creation, knowledge distribution, knowledge utilization. And there is, of course, there are many other dimensions interacting with that. And I'm just naming one dimension, which is, let's say, the, the local to the global. Um, because knowledge systems are situated. Um, even research knowledge is situated. So it always has a specific context um, and social embeddedment. Um, some knowledge systems perform on the global level and are succeeding. An article which is published in Nature has a global ambition. But many forms of knowledge are situated in national contexts or are situated in local contexts. Um, so the, the local basis of knowledge is also very important. Another very important di uh, dimension that I want to introduce is that most of the knowledge which drives people's behavior is not explicit. Research knowledge has the ambition of being explicit because when you draft an article for a peer-reviewed journal, you have to be very explicit about your conceptual framework, your methodologies, etc., etc. So you try to make that explicit. But even then, I would say the, the big majority of the knowledge in, embedded in that article is tacit. Because it's, it's based on ideas and, and suppositions that people in the, in the scientific community, in this case, share with each other. So the explicit forms of knowledge are, are only the tip of the, of the iceberg. What can we then say about the different forms of knowledge and how they are changing and evolving? Um, on the science side, on the research knowledge, I, of course we know this in, in enormous expansion of the research system. Uh, you, there are very beautiful graphs I can show you with the explosion of articles in in peer-reviewed journals or in uh, whatever databases or, or so. so um, I think many people would say that there is even an exaggerated explosion of research. Eh? Um, and there is, of course, such a huge pressure on researchers to produce knowledge and to publicize <coughs> that, um, that many people start to question, yeah, what, what is the relevance, what is the the impact, um, etc. And I'm sure that for a young field like artistic research, this is, a, this is a very difficult question to deal with. 
Um, and there are many debates on what counts as valid knowledge on, on paradigms, certainly in the humanities and the social sciences, uh, on approaches or methodologies. And these, these debates will, will further aggravate and become deeper. Um, but what is more interesting, I think, is the growing importance of what people call useful knowledge. How much of the knowledge which is produced is useful? Um, I'm not arguing against fundamental research, absolutely not. I think fundamental research has an absolutely important uh, role to play. But um, the, the usefulness of knowledge becomes of course a very important question when societies and economies become more knowledge intensive and become more dependent on, on the, the knowledge creation and knowledge the diffusion sector. And we see the emergence of various forms of, of research which are often also more localized, um, which have not these general global ambitions, uh, for example policy-oriented research, practice-oriented research, um, and some people call this mode two. I don't know whether mode two uh, research is something familiar to you. It's, a, I think, a, a, a quite a famous term now. Uh, it was coined by um, Michael Gibbons and, and Novotky and, and Peter Scott and some others in a very interesting book published in the early 90s. Um, and they said that there is a fundamental distinction uh, in between mode one research, which is, let's say, the the type of research which is published in Nature and Science, and the uh, mode two research which is much more situated, which was, is contextualized, applied, engaged, less generalizable, but more usable. Um, and uh, since, since the publication of that book, um, we have seen an enormous <coughs> rise of the interest in, in, in new forms of scientific research. Um, and, and how universities could deal with this tension. Um, and I think certainly for a new field like artistic research, this is a very interesting uh, phenomenon. <coughs> Many people in this debate, they argue that we should move much more to diversified sets of knowledge outputs and impacts. Um, I'm just showing you here a picture, but you could complete this with many other kinds of outputs. Um, Peer-reviewed articles, they are only the very small tip of the iceberg of knowledge production in any scientific field or discipline. Um, I'm not, again, I'm not arguing against them, I'm just saying that knowledge production and, and distribution mechanisms are much more complicated and much more bigger than only the production of peer-reviewed articles. And even peer-reviewed articles are becoming increasingly under scrutiny and under criticism. There is a huge debate emerging on, the, the, on peer review, which is the essence of how science functions. Um, we, we have seen so many mistakes in peer review. Uh, peer review is based on so many non-scientific criteria that people start questioning whether the way that we, since the 17th century, have defined the way science has to operate is still valid. I believe it's, it's becoming really, really critical to address these issues. Looking at another source of knowledge, because the question I'm interested in is how different forms of and, and types of knowledge interact. Um, professional knowledge. Uh, in any field, and I'm, I'm sure certainly also in the arts, um, there is a very important body of knowledge in your sector which we could call professional knowledge and which is dis distinct from research knowledge. Um, again, it's not always explicit, it's sometimes codified, maybe not in your profession, but for example think of the medical profession where you have an, a lot of professional norms, even the content of curricula uh, in medical schools is now defined by the European Commission, so you have all kinds of qualifications, uh, but a lot of it is still implicit, it's still tacit, um, transmitted through master-pupil interactions, through mentoring, and 
I think, a very interesting aspect of artistic um, knowledge is uh, the importance of this master-pupil relationship because that's so powerful in artistic training. Um, and it would be a very interesting topic for doctoral research to examine what's exactly happening between a master and, and, and a pupil in, in, uh, in musical education, for example. Um, I think it involves a lot of transmission of what we call professional knowledge, which is something which is very difficult to, to, to write in books, um, which is um, based on what we call in general workplace learning and uh, working or struggling with an instrument, um, which is exclusive, which is hidden to the outside world. I think one of the important <coughs> aspects of also, for example, think of the Middle Ages where craftsmen were educated by a master. Um, it was the transmission of knowledge which was, which was not to be handed over to external people, which was secret. The secrecy of professional knowledge. Um, so it's very strong insider-outsider views. If, um, if you are trained as a medical doctor, I believe that a very important part of that training is immersing you with the idea that you now belong to a corporation with its hidden rules, its secrets, its way of behaving, its way of greeting your colleagues, uh, etc. And that's not typical for the medical profession, that's in any profession. Any profession which evolves and which becomes socially important has that kind of rituals. There's nothing wrong with that. It, well, it can become socially dysfunctional to a certain degree, but uh, it, it's happening in any, any profession. It's very normative, it's embedded in historical patterns, in behavioral norms, and I'm sure that the art sector is a very, very strong example uh, of this. But it's also uh, in a field which I know much better, which is teacher training, it's also very powerful. Any teacher coming from a teacher training college into a school the first thing he or she, mostly she now, hears is forget everything you learned in teacher training. Now you see the real life and I will tell you what you have to do. Um, so this kind of immersion in, in the hidden and secret rules is uh, very important. I'm not suggesting that research knowledge and professional knowledge are the two main bodies of knowledge in a disciplinary field. I think there are many others. Uh, but I, I'm interested in the interaction between those two. But of course, any sector has also shared ideologies, shared political views. Um, why is the current government in my country, in this country, not very friendly to the arts sector? Because they think they're all leftist and they are all opposed to their economic and social views, which is, of course, a, a, a gross exaggeration. But you see that ideas about how sectors think become even politically very powerful. Um, personal experiences, experi what we call with a more beautiful term, experiential knowledge. Uh, experiential knowledge is a very, very important, it's still under research, but it's a, a very important aspect. Anecdotal knowledge. I worked for one of the most clever men I have ever met in my life. He was Minister of Education and I was his uh, Chief of Staff. Um, and we discussed uh, many very difficult issues, uh, maybe also the academization of, of uh, arts education in higher education. Um, and when we came at a critical moment of decision making, it was not, I have read this or this article and this has influenced my thinking and that. No, my niece went to that school and she experienced this or that, and I don't think that was right. We have to do this. Um, anecdotal knowledge plays a very important role in even the most enlightened people's thinking and decision-making. Community wisdom, something like common sense, um, is very powerful in driving people's behavior. So I could go on on this list. I'm just making the point that 
what happens in sectors and in professions is driven by many different knowledge systems. If, if you agree with this, then the next question is how do these things interact and change? Um, and be assured I'm still holding to the view that research knowledge has a very important role to play. Um, so, um, but the question is how does it interact with these other systems? And I think that the quality of the interaction is what is determining the fate of research knowledge in any sector. It is not the quality of the research. Of course, you should have a certain threshold level of quality of research. But what is important is how the, the, the research quality then, and the research knowledge that interacts with different knowledge systems in that sector. Knowledge dynamics um, can be very fast, dynamic, can be very slow. Um, and the, the main driver, of course, is research knowledge, because research knowledge is often the most new knowledge or the most critical knowledge, which is challenging perceived wisdoms in, um, in a sector. Um, and professional sectors where you see this happening, and I'm again taking the medical field, uh, where over the past 20 years I think we, we have seen an enormous transformation of the medical sector, away from the individual medical doctor as the old wise man who uh, had all the wisdom and who did what he needed to do. No, it's now a community of practice with layered, organized, driven by a, a very strong uh, biomedical science sector. Um, I'm not saying that this is an ideal picture, I'm just describing this as, as a, another example um, of, of a fast knowledge dynamics sector. Um, continuous process of exchange and interaction. And the most important interaction which happens is, let's say, the new expert knowledge introduced by new members of the profession who has, have gone through research intensive trainings. Um, and some people call this the greening of knowledge. And then the experiential knowledge, often tested by experienced members of, of the community or the sector acquired over years of professional practice, which some people call greening. Yeah, so the, let's say the knowledge dynamics to a large extent is the conflict between greening and greying. Uh, and the intergenerational renewal of, of, of the knowledge base. Um, so age, and I'm sorry, age is a very important variable um, in this. And I'm personally <coughs> convinced that the younger in, in the average age of the professionals a sector is, the more dynamic it is. Um, and I'm illustrate this with this picture. It doesn't come from any sector. It's based on our work on, on skills in general. So it's, you see literacy and university skills over, over the lifetime. The average distribution in OECD countries. Um, and you see the dotted lines, which are the raw scores. And when you correct these raw scores for educational attainment, for migration, for many other, for social background, you have the um, how do you call the straight lines? And you see uh, a very steep decline, certainly after the age of 50, I'm um, 58, so this is looking very badly. Um, but it, it, this is for literacy and numeracy, which are the, the foundation skills. Um, and the measures are not very basic, it's not being able to read and write, it's quite advanced levels of literacy and numeracy. But I, we think that it's a, a picture which is pretty similar for any kind of skill or any kind of, um, of knowledge. And I'm giving you another illustration because I don't have any data on the arts sector, um, but I do have data on the teaching uh, profession. And we examined the knowledge dynamics in the teaching profession. And what we did is compare new professionals less than two years in schools and experienced teachers. 
Um, and in this case, I'm showing you two charts, but they have exactly the same um, result. Here is it on, on teaching beliefs. Do I believe as a teacher that I have to transmit knowledge, which is direct transmission belief, or do I believe as a teacher that I have to empower my students to learn by themselves and I am the facilitator to, to support students? And so the more constructivist belief. Um, and the worrisome thing, which for me this is one of the most detrimental pictures that I have about education systems today. You see no difference between new teachers and the experienced teachers. After two years of practice, they, they seem to have forgotten everything that they heard. Or, or maybe teacher training colleges are so bad that they haven't produced any new research-driven knowledge, which is probably also the case. But um, the new teachers are not the innovators in their profession. And I'm showing you this for another variable, which is which we, in any process of professionalization, and someone spoke about professionalization um, uh, upstairs, um, the most the, the sociology of professionalization agrees that the most critical element of the development of most professions today is collaborative practice, cooperation. Um, and moving away from the individual definition of, of, of a professional into a more, much more collaborative definition. Team teaching, team working in the medical field, etc. This is the most critical transition. And if we ask these teachers or we examine teachers on this dimension, again we see the same. The there are differences between countries, but within a country there are no differences between young and experienced teachers. Which brings me to the conclusion that in the teacher field, in the educational sector, there is very little dynamics between young research-driven knowledge and the more older experiential professional knowledge that the, young, that the older teachers embody. Um, and this is, to, my, to me, this is problematic. And, and I don't have an idea of the ideal form or intensity of, of knowledge dynamics in a sector, but I would not accept the view that there is, that there is none at all. So I'm, I'm coming to, to the end. As I said, I'm, I'm not the expert in the arts, but I, I just want to give you some questions uh, to reflect on. This is basically the knowledge triangle uh, for the arts, and I think the, the most relevant questions that um, you have to ask yourselves as creators of new knowledge, as researchers, is first of all, what is the role of research in the creation of new knowledge, and that's, that's I think the easiest question, but how is knowledge contributing to innovation of professional practice, and does knowledge also improve um, education and these questions are very prominent in, in the in the papers that you that you uh, have uh, today and tomorrow um, and these are rather simple questions but I think they are very relevant these questions are not unique I, I've seen many examples around the world of, of even in the art sector of how they deal with these questions um, and this is a picture from an interesting example where um, arts universities are collaborating with local government and businesses and community partners in producing something which is the Creative Alliance of Dublin and they have a similar kind of view where they um, see their contribution as a, as a research organization in, in delivering different sets of knowledge into this dynamic process of social um, innovation. Uh, another very good example is, of course, but you know that much better than I do, is what happens at Aalto University in Finland, where you also have that view of, of a very dynamic process of not only the production of very scientific research, but also the generation of applied research in, in interaction with, with the profession, with, the, with industry, with local communities, um, etc. 
in the sociology of knowledge and, and innovation, um, this is now, it's maybe not so visible, um, a very powerful image. Um, it's not entirely new, it's produced some 10 years ago. Um, let's say that in the beginning, when this became a, an important topic, people were interested in how research data inform systems. And then people started to talk about information management. And then in the 90s, people talked about knowledge management. How can you manage the knowledge in a, in a sector? And now I think we, we move much more in, a, in, a, in the figure of knowledge ecology. And so in, in any system, any sector, any profession has a knowledge ecology where different forms of knowledge interact and where you have um, this, this synergy. Um, whether we will move to any kind of wisdom, that's another question which I will not deal with. Deal with. But ecology is a very interesting concept to reflect on um, on these questions. And this is my, my last slide. I, I think I have not been able to prove it, but um, my view is that there is a very complex interaction of research knowledge in a broader knowledge ecology in your sector, which is not only to be seen as research knowledge impacting on professional practice, that these interactions are seldom harmonious or without conflict, Conflicts between knowledge can be very powerful. Research should understand and appreciate the complexities of its usage and its relevance to education and professional practice. And it should also maximize its innovative potential in enhancing the dynamics in the knowledge economy of the sector. That's it. Thank you so much. It's a very interesting question and uh, it's, a, of course, more specific, specific than, than what I discussed here. Um, but I, I do believe that for any knowledge system to perform well, you have to have a free flows of knowledge. You have to have very open knowledge systems, creation, distribution, uh, sharing, etc. Um, I, I personally have a very strong view um, on, on this, which to some extent, but not entirely is shared by my organization. Um, in my organization, there is a very big tension between openness and intellectual property. And, and you know and that also in the arts, this is a very difficult debate. Um, I'm definitely on the side of openness. Um, and I do believe that the future of our societies and economies to a large degree, as President Obama also has mentioned a few days ago, is dependent on the openness with regard to, to the internet, but also in, to more generally to knowledge and information flows. Um, we, we do some work on open source, on open educational resources, on open publishing um, in the OECD, and we take a rather positive view on that. Uh, it happened that uh, a few months ago I was called to the OECD Secretary General, my big boss, um, because the 
the CEO of Wiley, had invited himself to discuss uh, the threatening of our work for the jobs of millions of people in the publishing industry, and I had to defend myself why I think that uh, open source publishing is, uh, is a much better thing for society than proprietary publishing. Um, luckily, my, the, the OECD big boss shared my view, uh, but um, this is a very, very important and powerful, I would say, even conflict at the moment. It is basically about the carriers of knowledge. How are the carriers of knowledge, uh, are they taking a proprietary form or are they taking an open, an open role? And um, what I, I do think that proprietary, let's say that openness is not in conflict with economic profit, profit making. Um, I don't think that open means for free in all cases. But you have to have free flows of, of knowledge where also economic uh, burdens do not jeopardize the free flow of, uh, of knowledge. And there are many, of course, uh, examples to illustrate that. I think the most painful examples are in the field of medical research and pharmacology where uh, universities are now even accepting the view that they wait with publishing scientific research outcomes um, until pharmacological companies have uh, registered their patents, um, which is, I think, so endangering the health of the, of the world's population because of these kinds of concerns is, in my, in my view, is criminal. But um, it's an interesting debate as well, a bit, bit more specific. Then. I take a very broad definition of innovation um, and it, it, I think it's very good that it's also here synonymous with engagement, which is an, any kind of application in economic or social or community practice or professional practice. So the, let's say the impact it has on, on outcomes other than the, in the research sector itself. And it can be in, in, in let's say, the more traditional definition of innovation, which is technologically based e economic uh, innovations and the valorization of research in new technolog in technologies. And uh, many universities are very much focusing on that kind because it also generates a lot of money. But I see it as much more broader. It can also be social innovation. It can be innovations in how professionals perform. Um, so, yeah, that's the way I see it. Yeah, good question. Um, it's true, I, I wanted to avoid very carefully the negative view on secret knowledge which is uh, apparent in many uh, discussions and, and, and writings about uh, knowledge. Um, because I see it as a very powerful and legitimate form of knowledge. It, it's maybe not open. Uh, so that's maybe the most difficult part of it, that it's secret and hidden for outsiders. But it's very powerful and I think, as I said, a lot of professional practice really depends on, on the things that people learn in that kind of, of, uh, of interactions. And um, uh, it's, it's not only valid for the art sector, eh? there is a huge explosion of research of, on an, an inter political interest in workplace learning um, anywhere. Um, 
some of these systems have, even also in this country, uh, we had a very interesting system of apprenticeship for young people, um, where they could learn trades and, and, and jobs uh, by going to someone in the field and, and staying there for, for a couple of years. That has almost disappeared until a couple of years ago when people started to say, well, wait a minute, that's actually very interesting. Why don't we rescue it and why don't we give it new power? And now it's starting up again. Um, and it's also an essential part of the famous dual system in Germany of, of industry-based uh, vocational training. Uh, so I believe in, in, in very powerful training systems which are focused on learning a certain profession or a job, uh, it is um, a very strong system and we should not disqualify it. Um, that's not the real answer to your question, but that's the way I see it. No, thank you very much. Yeah. Yes, please. There are no more questions. Than just oh, I'll do it. Yes. Well, I can. Uh, uh, we have published a couple of papers on this, uh, and the next year there will be a book where this uh, will be published more formally. Um, the data source is the Reflex study. Uh, it's only for Europe. Uh, the Reflex study was a large data collection of, of higher education graduates in the European Union. Um, I think the data collection was in 2005, and the data were available from 2008. And we have analyzed them in a number of ways, um, but the data allowed to identify people who were working in innovative jobs. And the, the, there is an international code of doing research on, on innovation, um, which is the Oslo Manual. And there you have all kinds of distinctions, and these distinctions are, are also very much present in that data collection. So that's why it's such an, an interesting um, data source. Um, yeah, I don't know whether that's an, an answer to your question. Uh, people are now thinking of repeating the reflex study, but it has a different name. It's now Eurograduate. And there is a consortium of European universities with European money trying to, to do that again. Uh, it, it, it's um, a study among higher education graduates after three, three years after graduation. Yeah, that's indeed a, a topic which I didn't develop very much because I, I didn't have the space for it. But, um, but first of all, the quality of the interaction, I wanted to give a, you a different view than the traditional view that researchers have the valid knowledge and they have to convince those who don't have the valid knowledge. And so that they have to argue against the prejudices of professionals. And that's for me a completely stupid view. Uh, but the quality of the research knowledge is a, is a very difficult topic and I, I'm thinking, I'm a researcher myself and I do think that we are, that we are really in the mud about this in the international community. And so the traditional, let's say, Popperian view of a good science system based on, on processes of, of falsification of, of research findings and so the un endless, uh, so I think there is now increasingly an understanding that this is maybe a very ideal picture but not close to the reality of, of scientific research in any sector, not even in physics. Um, and that um, well, there is increasing 
also concern about uh, not only plagiarism and many other faults in the system, but also what I mentioned on the essence of the mechanism, which is peer review. Um, any um, decent researcher in any field, even a very specialized field, is not able to master the knowledge of that field on a global level and is not able to make the judgments that he is supposed to make in peer review. And that's why so many articles appear in high rated scientific journals which prove to be wrong. The, the, of course, the tip of the iceberg are people who, who fraud, and that's also an important phenomenon. And it's increasingly important. And I think we underestimate the scope of scientific fraud. But there is, I think, a much more important reality under it that, that the reviewers make their judgment based on their best possible level of knowledge of the field, but they don't have any more the knowledge of that field and they cannot any longer make these kinds of, of peer judgments. Um, so the, and that's, that's not just a, an epiphenomenon of the science system, that's the heart of how science proceeds. If, if your peers cannot evaluate any longer the quality of, of what you are producing, um, then, the, then that's the, one of the basic premises of the science system which is really eroding. Um, and so that's, I, I really expect that this is going to become a very important debate. Um, but on the other hand, there are people who, who take these uh, observations and then they move to a completely postmodernist view that any, any kind of statement has equal validity or that, uh, that you can just produce um, any kind of, uh, of insight, uh, which I think is uh, completely exaggerated and, and stupid. Um, so the, the relativism <laughs> in, in, with regard to scientific knowledge is not a solution. We just have to, as the, the scientific revolution of the 17th century transformed completely the way that people develop knowledge, it did not uh, not all knowledge produced before was invalid, but it developed a new kind of, of way of producing knowledge. Um, but there is no certainty that that system will survive the 21st century. Last question, Sean. No, no, I was absolutely sure, 200% in agreement with you. Eh? So I, I, uh, it's just because I, I, I observe these the developments, but um, as, as a researcher, of course, you should look to peer reviewed journals. It's the only mechanism by which your relevance and validity uh, is, is checked in a, in, a, in a meaningful way. But it's far from perfect and it becomes increasingly imperfect. That's what I wanted to say. Yeah.